Okay, so welcome back to Humanities. Uh, this is actually the first regular lecture for the semester. Last time we just did an introduction to humanity as, Humanities as a subject. Today we're going to actually be going into the first historical overview. And that's going to be a long period of time that we're going to call the Ancient Near East, okay, or the history of the Ancient Near East. And it is a very difficult topic to cover in a single lecture. The number of civilizations that I want to hit upon are um, quite a few. So you could actually, you know, take a whole week probably an even a course like this, an overview course, where you focus on each of the different civilizations and empires. Uh, I'm not going to do that. We don't really have time to do that. So what I'm going to do is present basically a timeline overview of all of the cultures from ancient Sumeria up through ancient Persia. Okay, and there could be a lot of dates today. Uh, one thing you don't have to worry about is um, dates on tests. I'm not going to be hammering you guys with a lot of memorization of dates. Uh, names are a little bit more important. I'm going to try to highlight the key figures. And the way I'm doing this, like I said, it, it's difficult to really get into any particular civilization because we're doing such a quick overview. What I want to do is give for you this timeline where you can then plug in uh, the different topics you guys are going to be covering in your presentations, right? So there are different topics, like we talked about last time, that are going to relate to art, architecture, literature from different places. So some of you are doing some literature topics that have to do with the ancient Near East, particularly Mesopotamia. Some of you are working on some Egyptian stuff. Some of you are working on architecture from Mesopotamia or Egypt and so on even Persian Assyrian art. So I've got those presentations out there. What I want you to be able to do is kind of see the big picture so that you know what you're talking about in your presentations, where it would actually fit historically with respect to some of these other civilizations. So as I go through the PowerPoint, um, you know, it's kind of a, a quick survey and I'll slow down at certain points to say, hey, this is a guy that might be important. This is something you might want to think about when you're doing your presentation on, you know, the pyramids or certain key figures that you definitely want to include in those kind of presentations. So that's the goal today. Um, in the past, when I do this class lecture uh, live and in person, uh, I never ever get through the entire lecture in the time that we have. So I'm going to try to go at a decent pace. But also, I am going to um, you know, finish up the entire lecture before I stop the recording. So I think I mentioned that last time with you guys. So what I'm going to do is go over, share my screen with you guys, and let you see this historical overview of the ancient Near East. Okay, we're just going to dive in, and here we go. All right, let's do an overview of the civilizations. These are the cu cultures that we're going to cover today. The Sumerian, I've got the dates up there for you as well. Babylonian, what we call the Amorite period, the old Babylonian period. Ancient Egypt, which is probably the longest, you know, continuously running kingdom that we've got uh, on the list today. The Hittites, which may be less familiar to some of you. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, meaning the new Babylonian empire, the Chaldean period. And then finally, the Persian period. So, I'm going to try to do all that. And if you notice, just by the dates that I have there from the Sumerians, you know, 3500 BC, which is the beginning of the Bronze Age, to AD 641 or thereabouts, which is already in the Middle Ages or the medieval world, um, that's, you know, over 4,000 years of history. So we better get started. Um, just want to give you a little bit of blurb about pre-civilization, because when I use the word civilization, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. I don't want you guys to think that there wasn't, you know, human culture prior to civilization. We defined culture last time, right? We talked about the, um, you know, intellectual and artistic expressions of a group of people uh, that we're going to focus on as far as the study of humanities. But, you know, there were a long, long period of time before we actually derive what we would call civilization, right? Human habitation on the earth you know, we're going to just go back and just group them into general periods like the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic periods, which you may have heard of. Uh, I may know, and you can text answers every once in a while. I'll ask for some feedback. But um, how many have heard the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, and know what those words mean? Paleo. Uh, if you don't know your roots, you might not be able to figure this out. Paleo, meaning the old Stone Age. 
Mesolithic meaning the Middle Stone Age. And then what would the Neolithic mean? I know somebody can get this pretty quickly. You could either use your, use your microphone or text it. <coughs> Neo means... Uh, that was when we started agriculture and living in towns rather than uh, teepees, tents, and other uh, living arrangements. Good, good. Um, yeah, Neolithic would be the new Stone Age. So it's actually a, a big revolution. It's called the Neolithic Revolution that takes place in that period. So we're going to put it, you know, roughly 7,000 to 5,800 BC. And that's exactly what happens. You have the advent of agriculture. Uh, which means settled habitation, Paleolithic, Metalithic, Mesolithic periods. You have more of you know hunter-gatherer societies, mobile groups. Not that those disappear with the advent of the Neolithic period, but you know certain people do settle down. And one of the essentials for settled living is having uh, a food source where you need to develop agriculture, husbandry, the domestication of animals, all that kind of stuff. And you're going to have uh, you know little villages spring up, which evolve into towns and Later, we're going to get to the cities, and that's where the civilization really begins. So, very good. Uh, the last period you probably have never heard of, the Calcolithic period. Uh, Calcolithic just refers to the fact that people start to now use, um, I was about to say bronze, but copper as a tool. So all of these periods are basically named after the technology, right? We talked about historical periods and how we group them based on either technology or different events. So Calcolithic, uh, which literally means, you know, the, um, the copper stone, it's kind of a, a mixture of the two. They're using those types of equipment at that period. Moving further, we're still in pre-civilization. I want to focus in now on Mesopotamia. And in Mesopotamia in particular, there are a number of um, subgroups or sub um, eras, I guess you could say. So you've got, you know, the Hasuna period, the Halaf period, the Samara period. And the last one, which is around 5,500 to about 4,000, is called the Ubaid period. And you don't need to know the names of any of those periods, but this is where you have the settled developments in Mesopotamia. And the reason I want to say the Ubaid period is going to be the most relevant to our discussion is because we're talking about the area of Mesopotamia that's in the south. Earlier on, right, and we're kind of following um, the last ice age, which would have been wrapping up and retreating, you know, they had glaciers close to 9,000 BC or so. I'm just giving approximate dates. The further back we go in history, the more approximate the dates are. Um, that region in the southern portion of Mesopotamia is still kind of swampy, and you don't have uh, settlements really developing there until a little bit later than you have in northern Mesopotamia. But it's in the Ubaid period that you're going to have the beginning of a settlement that will evolve into the world's first city, and that's going to be the city of Uruk. Okay, uh, What you see on the screen now is just a uh, shadowy map of Mesopotamia. If you're not familiar with Mesopotamia, this is literally the land between the rivers, and those two rivers being the Tigris and Euphrates. This is part of what often is called the Fertile Crescent. So if you were to trace up from the Persian Gulf through Mesopotamia and down the Jordan River Valley uh, to the West, you would have basically the crescent that we're talking about. But this is the earliest civilization well, um, in human history that's going to spring up in the southern portion of Mesopotamia. Okay, so I know the map is not necessarily the clearest, but at the very bottom you can see some of the major cities. Now, if you if you see the cities on the map, you'll notice that they're quite a ways away from the Persian Gulf itself. That was not the case in the ancient world. Okay, the Persian Gulf came up. Of course, it wasn't called the Persian Gulf then, but it was uh, all the way up closer to those cities. It's the river, um, you know, laying down the silt and stuff that has kind of brought the <coughs> uh, coast a little bit further from where the original coast was in the ancient world. If you ever study ancient history or geography or even geology, um, you'll learn that a lot of times the Coastal areas uh, changed drastically over periods of time. Cities that were once really prosperous because of where they were located um, often, you know, just lose their prosperity, lose their position um, as, you know, commercial centers, for instance, if it was a city that was based on sea trade and all of a sudden you have uh, changes in the geography that render it impossible for them to, re you know, remain there and do business. So um, you can think of ancient Sumer as something like that. <clears throat> 
Anyways, let's talk about Sumeria. This is our first civilization. It's going to be the birthplace of civilization. And this map's a little bit more clear. You can see some of the major cities here. And I'm going to go through just to you know, highlight a few of them for you. So some of the important cities. Uruk, I would put at the top of the list. This is probably the oldest city that we have, archaeologically speaking. Um, definitely predates 4000 BC, though we might not want to refer to it as a city until around 3500. So it was probably just a large town uh, which develops. Uh, it's known as being the place for the famous King Gilgamesh, uh, one of the most important ancient epics centers around that figure. Uh, had a number of gods. And one of the interesting things about, and we'll talk about religion in a different lecture, but um, a number of well, basically the cities of ancient Sumeria had patron deities, which means there were usually particular cults that were preeminent in a particular location. In the city of Uruk, the two most important figures were the, the god An, who is the god of the heavens, and the goddess Inanna, who is a god of love, a goddess of love and war. So you have uh, sanctuaries to both of them in the city of Uruk. And you could say the peak of that city is around 2800 BC. The city of Kish, which is a little bit further north. Um, according to the Sumerian legend, this was the earliest city in Mesopotamia. The city of Lagash, this is one of the first cities to actually start to dominate Sumeria. Uh, these city-states early on are all independent, independent kings, but every once in a while you're going to have a, a, a king or a city that tries to assert its influence and authority over other cities, and Lagash was one of the cities to do that pretty early on, say around 2500. Uh, the cult of Ningirsu was sit, uh, central there. The city of Ur, very famous if you're familiar with Old Testament stories, particularly the book of Genesis, mentions the city of Ur as the birthplace of the patriarch Abraham. We'll talk about the Hebrew people much later in the semester, but that's according to the book of Genesis. It was also a very important city in its own right. Uh, the cult of Nana, the moon god, was at Ur. The city of Eridu, which was one of the earliest cult centers, sacred to the god Enki. And then, which you can't see exactly on the screen because of that little logo, um, the city of Nippur, again, close to Kish up in the north, not, you know, north for Sumeria, uh, where the god Enlil, who was one of the most important deities, resided. Okay. So let's talk about the rise of civilization briefly. We just talked about agriculture developing in the Neolithic period, um, very essential for Sumeria. So once that southern region started to dry out enough where you could actually build settlements, they started to farm, uh, definitely required irrigation. The rivers were pretty important, obviously. You need, and it's not surprising that early civilizations usually spring up in a river valley, and Sumeria is uh, one of those civilizations. Tigris and Euphrates needed to be managed, however, so you have irrigation systems developing, and that requires social organization. Uh, the larger the settlement, the more you're going to have a demand for different um, structures in place, whether they're religious or civil, as far as providing uh, a sense of authority. And we'll start to talk about civilization once we have a city, that's where the word comes from, from the Latin word for a city, and what distinguishes a city from a town is generally going to be not just the size of the place, but the division of labor, where you've got usually a city center, um, administrative, uh, complexes very often as well as temples but people are doing different types of work right it's not that everybody is uh, you know farming like a farming village or uh, in commercial trade in a, you know a trading town but you've got people and a hierarchy really develop and that's going to be one of the big signs of city living you also have a need for record keeping so incidentally when you have the rise of cities very often you have the rise or development of early writing Okay, which comes very often in the form of pictograph. So talking about Sumerian writing, it evolves. So we have writing first show up in Uruk, again, one of the earliest cities. And this is going to be around that pivotal point, around 3500 BC, when we say civilization dawns. Now, pictograph, you've probably heard of, it's drawing through pictures. Okay, and they're really useful for capturing objects, nouns, not really good for representing verbs and ideas, 
Okay, so pictograph is going to be very limited in the earliest types of writing. We're basically re uh, just restricted to keeping records of inventories, whether they're temple inventories, offerings to the gods, or commercial inventories. So this was developed probably with its connection to trade, but evolved over time to a more efficient system, not efficient compared to what we use today, but what was called cuneiform, which is the web, web wedge-shaped impressions, uh, which come from the fact that they use reeds and they would impress the reed. You know, you could a cross-section of the reed, it makes a little, little wedge-shaped um, cross-section of the, the object, but you would press it into wet clay and it left those wedge-shaped impressions. So if you look at the picture at the bottom there, you can see some cuneiform on a hardened tablet. Okay, a lot of times these tablets could be baked. They didn't always do that. A lot of times they just dried, but it's really nice when we have a city that was burned. Um, not good for them, but good for us because a lot of times the clay tablets would be cooked. And once you uh, fire a clay tablet, it is going to be preserved forever. Okay, it doesn't disintegrate. It can be smashed, unfortunately, but we have lots of these clay tablets. Uh, the picture in the center, by the way, is a, um, a cylinder seal. This is something that they would roll along a wet clay um, piece to leave this impression. So you can actually see the cylinder seal on the left. And on the right, you've got the impression that that seal made once it was rolled across the clay. They could use this to you know, sign documents or um, jars or, or whatever they needed to do to kind of put their mark on something. Okay, anyways, the oldest written literature is going to come from ancient Sumeria as well. Uh, I already mentioned the Epic of Gilgamesh. That would probably be a, have been put into writing somewhere around 2000 BC, but it was put into writing after a long oral tradition, which would date back to the earlier portion of the second millennium, um, third millennium, sorry, from the time of Gilgamesh. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. This is the first hero story that we have in world literature. <clears throat> okay. So, chronology for Sumeria. We're going to say the early Uruk period, about 4,000 to 3,500, that would be pre-civilization. And then with the late Uruk period, this is when Uruk really developed at, uh, you know, towards its peak, the, you know, the rise of civilization, the urbanization of the city, uh, which is kind of redundant. It is the first and largest city, and we would coincide, this coincides with what we call the beginning of the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age now for this region is going to run from about 3500 BC down to about 1150 or thereabouts. Uh, what you see in the picture here, and I'm not always going to point out the pictures, but I know one of the groups is going to be working on Sumerian temple architecture, particularly the ziggurats. And I think that's group two. I could be wrong. I don't have that list in front of me. But what you see is a reconstruction of the White Temple of Uruk, which was one of the earliest raised platforms for a religious building in Sumeria. It doesn't look exactly like a later ziggurat, but it is definitely a predecessor. So you could start to see an evolution of that style um, right here. So if you're doing a presentation on the ziggurats, I would say include the White Temple of Uruk in that presentation. And that would be, by the way, a sanctuary to the god An or Anu. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, moving further, uh, the next period is called the Early Dynastic Period. You're going to start to have kingship and records of dynasties. If you have heard the word dynasty before, you might know what it means. It's a ruling family, and you have a number of ruling families start to pop up in various Sumerian cities. Uruk, I give you a list there of a few of the kings of the first dynasty. Um, this period of the king list of Uruk, you know, run a little bit longer. The first dynasty isn't from 2900 to 2100. It's in the earlier portion of that era. Um, you know, you've got uh, Meshki Angashir, who's supposedly the founder of Uruk, though Enmir Kar, his successor, is also listed as a founder of Uruk. Um, and uh, Menki uh, Angashir, by the way, when it says son of Utu on the slide, Utu is a god. Okay, um, so you've got this idea that the kings are descended from the gods, this idea of divine authority being uh, bestowed upon an earthly ruler. And one of the theories as to the rise of kingship was that the early kings arose from a priestly class. Um, they weren't necessarily viewed as gods themselves, but intermediaries between gods and men. 
Um, as you go down that first dynasty, you'll notice when we get to the end of the list I'm, I've given you, you've got the name Gilgamesh. He shows up in the king lists of Uruk, and if we were going to put him at a particular spot, it would be somewhere around 2700 BC, even though I said the story of Gilgamesh doesn't get written down to much later. So you can imagine if there was a historical Gilgamesh, and a lot of people do think there was, he was probably an impressive enough ruler for people to tell stories about him. And then this oral tradition evolves and is built upon and then eventually leads to a wonderful work of literature. And if you were in my mythology class, uh, we would actually go over the story. It's one of my favorite stories um, from Sumeria, but we're not going to do it here. The next period is where you see some early unification in Sumeria, around 2500, the rise of Ur, the rise of Lagash. I'm not going to go through all these figures, like Ernanche, who kind of begins, I don't want to call it an empire yet, but um, they're definitely going to expand him and his son Anatom, the power of Lagash. And you also have in this period, and it's worth noting, Urukagina, who left records of early social and political reform. So we don't tend to think of, you know, reformers when it comes to politics. You know, in the modern world, you've got a lot of this kind of stuff, right? Um, uh, movements for social reform, movements for this or that. Um, and it's been around for the, from the very beginning, essentially, is what I'm just trying to show you here. But uh, there was already corruption, right? As soon as you get cities and politics um, and religion, you very often have corruption along with that because they're important things. And when you have people in positions of power, we all know that power can be abused. Okay, so he... I guess fairly enlightened leader comes in and starts to reform things. And one of the things that he does is abolish something like debt slavery. Now, does anybody have an idea of what debt slavery might be? Uh, that would be when someone owes a whole bunch of money to one particular person and to pay that back, they uh, sign themselves over for, for work to Very. pay off the debt. Very good. Very good. That's exactly what it is. So the, this this type of slavery in particular uh, is not a race-based slavery. As a matter of fact, race-based slavery is uh, very rare in the ancient world. Um, you do have slaves uh, taken from conquered peoples in times of battle and war and stuff like that. But this would be a uh, uh, type of slavery where you have people of the same culture and community enslaving one another due to debt. Yeah, very good. Um, it might be closer to what we might think of as indentured servitude, though there are some differences. I know a lot of people that came to the United States, well, sorry, before the United States, to the colonies, the American colonies, came over as indentured servants. And that was, uh, you know, basically to pay their way to the colonies, and then they would work to pay off that um, debt. Um, so it's similar to that. Um, problem is sometimes once you get into slavery based on debt, it's very difficult to ever get yourself out of that situation. So every once in a while, you'll have a, a ruler come along and just abolish it. This usually doesn't go over very well with the upper class, the people that those debts are owed to. We'll look at a similar situation in the uh, development of early Athens later this semester. Okay. Next period would be the Akkadian period, 2300, uh, so yeah, 2350 to 2200 BC. This is a period that can be viewed as an interruption of Sumerian civilization because the Akkadians were not Sumerians. The Akkadian people were a Semitic people, so the language of Akkadian would be closer to the language of later Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. Arabic and Hebrew are some of the uh, Semitic languages that are still around today, but in the ancient world there were lots of different um, uh, Semitic uh, tongues. It's basically a language group. The Sumerians, by the way, are non-Semitic, and the Sumerian language is not related at all to these. It was unique. Uh, the figure that's most important here is Sargon, sometimes called Sargon the Great. And according to legends about him, he began as a cupbearer uh, to the king of Kish, or Zababa, rose to a position of power, uh, ended up dominating Uruk, under the, the king of Lugal Zagezi, who was uh, a fairly powerful ruler in his own right at the time. And then uniting all of Mesopotamia under himself and even conquering beyond Mesopotamia, he formed an empire. And that's what an empire essentially is. And when one culture goes out and conquers and dominates other groups, okay? 
Uh, his center was at a place known as Akkad or Agade. We don't know where that city is. So if you see that map on the screen, there's a, co a question mark next to it because we have not found it yet. We know about where it was, but it's been lost in the deserts of time. What's also important about him would be some of his children, in particular his daughter and Hedwana, who was put into a position as priestess or high priestess at the city of Ur for the god Nana. Now, the reason she's important is because she is going to leave behind some wonderful poetry, in particular, a poem called The Exaltation of Inanna, which is the goddess of Uruk. And one of you guys, one of your, one of your groups, <laughs> you're going to be doing a presentation that involves looking at the poem. Okay, so you definitely want to focus in a little bit on Enhedwana. We'll talk more about her when you guys do your presentation. Uh, of course, Sargon left a dynasty, which goes for a couple generations. Among his successors, the most important is probably his grandson, Naram Sin. And in this particular picture, you've got a picture of Naram Sin, the, the Stella of Naram Sin. And he was one of the kings who definitely saw himself as more than mortal. He declares himself a god on earth. And now this idea of a divine king, and we said originally, you know, the kings probably arose from the priestly class, but weren't necessarily viewed as gods. You do have exceptions. Some kings will promote themselves as gods on earth. Now this is going to be very common for Egypt. As a matter of fact, it's the rule, not the exception when it comes to Egypt. But for this particular region in the time, this was an interesting move. And we're going to see this come back again and again over time later on, particularly in the Hellenistic period uh, and then the Roman period. The dynasty supposedly fell because of a curse laid on the family due to sacrilege cr uh, committed by Naram Sin as well. It's a poem called The Curse of Akkad that we have. Uh, so anyways, his dynasty falls, and then we move into the final period of Sumerian civilization. Uh, basically, the collapse comes for them by an invasion of some new people known as the Gutians. They resist it as long as they can, but ultimately the Gutians take over briefly until they are themselves pushed out by uh, Utu Hengal of Uruk. And then the last period, which is the one I was mentioning a second ago, is the Neo-Sumerian period from 2200 to 2000 BC. And this is where the city of Ur reestablishes its authority over Sumeria. And the kings, like Urnamu, who is the most important king of this period, assumes a title that is king of Sumer and Akkad. Okay, Akkad has had such an impact during the time of their empire that um, you know he's not proclaiming that he's just king of Sumer, but king of Akkad as well. And he also gives us a really important law code. It's one of the oldest law codes that we have. I know one of you groups are going to be doing a presentation on Hammurabi's law code. It's worth noting that Hammurabi's law code contrary to popular belief, is not the oldest law code we have. There were older Sumerian law codes, sometimes very similar to what was going on with Hammurabi, um, but we'll look at Hammurabi later. He's um, doing something that's already been done, so we can all you know, go back to Sumer for this. Anyways, around 2000, you get the collapse of the civilization, usually, mainly due to warfare. Um, there are spec is speculation uh, as to the changes in climate, that had something to do with it. We do know that the irrigation from the rivers, the whole irrigation system, tended to, over a long period of time, lay down a lot of salt into the earth, and that would have definitely changed um, how productive the land was, and it may be uh, a collapse due to environmental factors. Um, that's very often the case. If you ever study, and we're not gonna do it this semester, but um, the Indus River Valley civilization, uh, you have some similar things with cli uh, climate change and uh, changing river courses and stuff like that. So at the end, Sumer basically collapses, but it's gonna be replaced. And it was also at war with the civilization of Elam, which would have been to the east of Mesopotamia. They are, are one of those powers that comes in and out of um, uh, Near Eastern history have you know peaks and valleys in their own uh, prosperity, and I'm not going to mention a whole lot about Elam because it's a little bit beyond where we want to go. Okay, let's move to Babylon because the next really important empire that ri arises in Sumeria, I'm sorry, in Mesopotamia, are going to be the Babylonians. We'll call this the Old Babylonian or the Akkadian period. On the map, you could see where central 
Babylon is, or rather I should say where Babylon is located in central Mesopotamia, right in the middle, very close to where Sargon would have had his capital. It's also the place where the rivers uh, get the closest, and we want to focus mostly on Hammurabi. Now here's this new group, the Amorites. The Amorites are a Semitic group, and there was a period of migration around the end of the Sumerian period. So around 2000, you've got migration of Semitic tribes known as Amorites that come into Mesopotamia. They dominate the north, where Assyria is located. They move into central Mesopotamia and have a major city at Babylon, but they also cover regions in the uh, further west in Syria, like Damascus would be a very important city that was dominated by the Amorites as well. Now, it's Babylon that we're going to pay attention to. And the most important guy in this early period is obviously Hammurabi. It's a name you guys have probably heard of. I'm giving you his dates around 1792 to 1750. He was the sixth king of this dynasty, this Amorite dynasty. And he unified most of Mesopotamia. I say on the slide all of Mesopotamia, but he didn't quite conquer everything in the north. Known for his code, right? And that is a picture of the code as well on the, the stela of <clears throat> the Code of Hammurabi. It's found in the Louvre in Paris. I had the fortune of going to see it in person. Um, it's very impressive. Uh, if you're an archaeology uh, junkie, you'd be interested in stuff like that, but it's much larger than it appears on the screen. Okay. Anyways, very quickly, the expansion completes within a generation of Hammurabi's death by the time of his grandson, around 1725, all of Babylon, or rather I say all of Mesopotamia, has been taken into Babylonian control. Of course, very soon, not very soon, but by 1600, Babylon moves from being at its peak to being at its low point. Uh, the city of Babylon itself was sacked around 1600 by a group known as the Hittites, who we're going to cover shortly. They don't occupy or conquer, but they do sack the city and withdraw, leaving it vulnerable to an actual invasion by some new tribes that come in known as the Kassites. And that essentially ends the Amorite period. And the Kassites are going to continue to rule Babylon for the next 400 or so years until they are conquered by the Elamites, who I just mentioned. All right? So that period um, is going to be known as the Kassite period. And we're not going to cover that period, okay? It's it's kind of a dark period, not a lot. Um, that's worth noting, at least for our purposes. So let's move our way down to North Africa, Egypt. Now, most of the time, my students are familiar with Egypt more than any of these other groups. And I don't know if that's just, you know, thanks to Hollywood and movies like The Mummy, um, or just a fascination with Egyptian art. I think the artwork that is produced by ancient Egypt is going to be something you could probably close your eyes and picture. It's very distinct. A lot of people find it very attractive. One of the neat things, as you guys do your presentations on art, you'll notice that there is a great deal of continuity in Egyptian art from beginning to end, as there is a good bit of continuity throughout the existence of Egypt as a kingdom. You do have ups and downs, periods of disunity, but overall the history of Egypt is one long, uh, stable government. Okay, and it might be a little bit of an overstatement, but I'm just going to go with that. It's often called the gift of the Nile because if it wasn't for the Nile, of course, there would be no Egypt. I listed a few important cities, uh, starting with Ombos, which was a very, very early on the map that you see. It's at Nakata, which is down in what we would call um, Upper Egypt, okay, which is south. Uh, you probably should know how we distinguish Upper and Lower Egypt. You can see on the map where they're labeled Upper and Lower, and it's absolutely opposite of what you would think, and it's due to the way the Nile flowed. Right, it flowed from south to north and emptied into the Mediterranean Sea in that triangular area at the top, which is known as the delta. It comes from the Greek letter D, which is a triangle. Okay, the delta. So the delta region in the north would be what we call Lower Egypt. Anyways, um, Ombos would be an early pre-dynastic royal city. So you have some early pharaohs that would have been centered there. Memphis, which is in the portion of Lower Egypt to the to the north. That is uh, the early capital and a recurring capital throughout Egyptian history. Very important city, very close to Cairo, where you're going to have um, the great modern city. And of course, Giza, where you have the famous pyramids. That's all around the area of Memphis. 
Thebes, major religious center down in the south. Avaris, which is up in the Delta region. This is a capital during the second intermediate period, known for occupation by a group known as the Hyksos. We'll cover them later. Akitatan, which is located right there in the middle of the map. Uh, it's labeled as El Amarna. This is the capital during the Amarna period. We'll cover that specifically during a discussion on religion, not today, but on a different lecture. Uh, Karnak, uh, center for the worship of the god Amun. And then later, when Greeks take over Egypt, you're going to have the city of Alexandria, which is right on the Mediterranean coast, the eastern portion of the delta, one of the most important and largest cities in all of the Hellenistic world later on. Okay, so let's dive into uh, a little bit more on Egyptian culture. Definitely had contact with Mesopotamia, and there's speculation as to what level of influence one played upon the other, whether Egyptian civilization emerged as a consequence of its exposure to Mesopotamian civilization. Uh, it's very possible that it did. There was trade between these groups. We do know that writing arose in Egypt a little bit later than it did in Mesopotamia, um, but not very much later, and they also derived a pictographic language uh, known as hieroglyphic. I shouldn't say language, it's actually a written system. And I know you've heard of hieroglyphics. It's holy writing, that's what the word literally means, and that's because of the Greeks. They didn't know that it wasn't just religious in nature. Um, the scribes of Egypt, it would take, obviously, uh, a well-educated individual to be able to write uh, in any of these languages, cuneiform included, but uh, hieroglyphics was a very difficult uh, medium. But they did have simplistic or simplified versions of it. Uh, hieratic would be more of a, a cursive script that was used simultaneous. It's not like a hieratic replaced hieroglyphic the way cuneiform replaced Mesopotamian pictograph. They were used simultaneously. They never stopped using their hieroglyphs, even though they developed other written systems later on. And they're going to maintain the use of hieroglyphics even into the Roman Empire period. Okay. It ceases at the end of the 4th century AD. Okay, so that's a long uh, period of use. So even though it's not very efficient, it was something they embraced. We couldn't read it for centuries. Now, this is another very famous archaeological discovery that you may have heard of, the Rosetta Stone. As a matter of fact, there's an entire uh, computer program, system, school, business, whatever it's called, that teaches language called Rosetta Stone. Has anybody ever taken... Uh, done a Rosetta Stone class or course? I tried it out years ago for learning Italian. Uh, pretty useful, but it's named after this. The stone itself was found back in 1799. This was actually found when uh, Napoleon's troops were in Egypt. Currently, it's in the British Museum, but the cool thing about it is the languages. It's written in hieroglyph at the top, demotic in between, and then in Greek at the bottom. And the reason this is so useful is because it's not just that there are three languages on the tablet, it's the same text in three languages, and Greek was always something people could read. So um, they actually were able to decipher, um, it's kind of guesswork, uh, how this has happened, but they were able to identify a name in the text. You can't really see it very clearly here, and I'll talk about this when we do religion later, but there's a cartouche, actually a number of what we call a uh, cartouche, in the top portion, which is this series of hieroglyphs encircled um, by this long oval, which is basically a, a magical symbol of protection, and that would usually indicate a name. Now, we have identified you know, the name Ptolemy in the last section, and they assumed that one of the cartouche up above included that name, and eventually they were able to figure out the different symbols that produced the sound Ptolemy, and once they started to you know, get on a roll, they were able to decipher hieroglyphs. That's a very you know, abbreviated form uh, of how this was done. It's not as easy as I make it sound nor can I read hieroglyphics, so I apologize. <clears throat> uh, monumental architecture is going to uh, start, not necessarily start in Egypt, but stone monumental architecture definitely starts in Egypt. Uh, we've got uh, objects like the obelisk, which you see on the right, a mastaba, which is an early form of tomb, which you see uh, to, the, to the left of that. 
uh, and then eventually the pyramid, which will be developing. We'll look at some pyramids in a second, but uh, they basically evolve out of the mastaba construction, which is just a rectangular mud brick or stone tomb that you have the earliest royalty buried beneath. The tomb chamber would be below the mastaba. They are uh, very good astronomers. They were able to develop a calendar, which is the most efficient calendar, a solar calendar of 365 days. This is later going to be borrowed by the Romans and later by us. You know, we have kind of adopted the Roman calendar with some modifications. Uh, they also have produced paper for us. Luckily, uh, we think of paper, the papyrus, as something that's very durable. Technically, it disintegrates just like any other paper would. Um, but luckily, we have lots of it remain because of the climate in Egypt. You know, not necessarily due to the great quality of papyrus, but because of the dry climate where it's been stored. So it's uh, definitely more useful and uh, convenient to write upon than clay tablets. So... All right, as far as that chronology goes, let's just go through Egyptian history very quickly, starting with the simple farming villages and fishing villages along the Nile that go back to the 4th millennium BC. Uh, the uh, kingdoms, you do have two kingdoms evolved pretty early on, so somewhere before 3150, you've got the kingdom of Upper Egypt, the kingdom of Lower Egypt, and then a unification which takes place in what we call the early or proto-dynastic period. So around 3150 to 2686, would be the period where Egypt is first unified and the pharaoh is going to be known as king of Upper and Lower Egypt. And the first pharaoh to apparently unify the kingdoms was a guy by the name of Narmer. And what you see next to that is the Narmer palette, which shows King Narmer on both sides. This is a two-sided tablet. Um, in each side, he's wearing a different crown. One, the white crown, as you see on the, the left, it's called the white crown. And on the right, in the upper portion, you see him wearing what's called the red crown. That would be the crown of Lower Egypt, the white crown of Upper Egypt. So this indicates that he was king over both regions. And uh, interestingly, though, we don't have him mentioned in any of the oral or later traditions and king lists that the Egyptians have. Um, this was a discovery by archaeology. When you get to the legends and written material from the ancient world, the first pharaoh is known as Menes, and there has never been a discovery of any pharaoh by that actual name, and it's probably just a made-up name, or maybe a title, because the word men uh, means established. So uh, we could say the first pharaoh was Menes, and maybe that name actually referred to Narmer himself. The other figure that you see on the screen is a guy by the name of Kasakemwi, and this particular figure, or figurine rather, is an early portrait that we have. We have two portraits that survive of this figure. So these are the first freestanding statues that we have. Obviously, Narmer's earlier, so we do have illustrations of him, but the first statuary is from Kasakemwi. The first statue of any historical figure in the world happens to be this little miniature, and it's really about the size of a G.I. Joe figure, um, and not the big G.I. Joe figures when I was a kid, the later G.I. Joe figures. Um, so very small, and if you're doing your presentation on Egyptian portraits and art, you probably want to include Casa Kemui in there, at least as a, um, you know, kind of an important figure, just for the fact that we have his statue that remains. Moving into the Old Kingdom, the Old Kingdom is a kingdom of a good deal of prosperity and wealth because you start to see really powerful pharaohs build some really impressive architecture. The Old Kingdom pharaoh by the name of Zoser or Djoser builds the first pyramid, which you see up above there is the Step Pyramid of Djoser, which is built by a famous architect by the name of Imhotep. That's actually a, uh, a statue of Djoser himself. But this is often called the Age of the Pyramids. Not that there weren't some pyramids built after the Old Kingdom. There were, but many fewer. And they started to move away from pyramid building after the Old Kingdom and start to uh, have different types of burials. The um, presentation that, I forget which group it is. Again, I don't remember the numbers. You guys are doing a, a presentation on pyramids and ziggurats, but you definitely need to include the Pyramid of uh, Zoser in there, the Step Pyramid. I'm not going to say any more about it now. We'll talk about that when we do the presentations. The next dynasty, fourth dynasty, have some of the most famous pyramid builders of all time, beginning with Snefru, who was the founder of the dynasty, and he built several pyramids, including this one you see called the Bent 
pyramid. He also built one that is known as the Red Pyramid, which is the first true pyramid. And when I say true pyramid, I'm talking a smooth-sided pyramid, unlike a step pyramid earlier. Now, Stafiru's son, Khufu, builds the most famous of all pyramids, which is the Great Pyramid. So here are the famous Giza pyramids. These three are not the Great Pyramids, plural. There's only one of them that is the Great Pyramid. And also, contrary to belief, it's not the one in the middle. The Great Pyramid is the one in the back of this shot. Okay, It's bigger than the one in the middle. You just can't tell by the photograph. Um, Khafra and then Menkara built the other two. Menkara himself, we have some wonderful statuary of him. So if you're doing your uh, presentation on portrait sculpture, probably want to include some early Egyptian portrait sculptures like this one, the statue of Menkara. Okay, moving on. The intermediate period, we have these periods of disunity. Every once in a while, Egypt loses cohesion, breaks apart into sometimes several kingdoms again, uh, usually due to invasion or dis, uh, dysfunction in the royal family. Uh, you have the first intermediate period, 2181 to 2040, and then a reunification during the Middle Kingdom from 2040 to about 1782. The figure that you see on this uh, slide is uh, center set a pharaoh that is mentioned in a story that I'm having you guys talk about. One of the presentations is going to be on a story known as the story of Sinue. Uh, so that's really all I'm going to mention for the Middle Kingdom period until we get to religion later. But the story of Sinue is a very important writing from this period. And there are two historical figures mentioned in the, peer, uh, uh, the piece that are rulers, Amenemet and his son Senorset. So those two figures I've listed for you on the slide. Uh, the character of Sinue himself, there are questions as to whether or not he was an actual historical figure. Okay, we don't know. But if you're doing that presentation, you probably want to have a little bit of mention of uh, Amenemet and Senorset and the actual event that sparks the action of the narrative, which happens to be the assassination of Amenemet. He's a, he was killed at the end of his reign. Then you have the second intermediate period, which is, again, disunity, but it's a more important intermediate period than the first because of a group that migrated into Egypt known as the Hyksos. And we don't know a whole lot about how this migration took place. The Egyptians themselves characterized it as somewhat of a conquest or an invasion, though it may have been a slow migration of people coming down into Egypt. I mean, Egypt was very prosperous and produced a lot of food. But these Hyksos, or what are sometimes derogatively referred to as the desert princes, were Semitic people from the north that moved in. And when they came in, they actually introduced some new technology to Egypt, such as the chariot, which is going to revolutionize Egyptian warfare and lead to Egypt building its own empire once the intermediate period concludes. The 15th dynasty, which would have been the Hyksos dynasty, ruled from the capital in the north, uh, the delta region known as Avaris. Uh, excavations there have uncovered a lot of interesting stuff, and I think the excavations are still in progress. Um, but again, this is the second intermediate period. We'll also bring this up when we talk about the ancient Hebrew people, because the Hebrews were Semites, and of course their oral tradition mentions, and in their you know written documents like the book of Genesis, mentioned a time of, e uh, of Hebrew presence in Egypt. So there's all kinds of speculation as to how this might fit in with the Hyksos period in Egypt. Anyways, the next is the New Kingdom. This is the period of Egyptian domination. This is where you have an empire built. Now that they have the, tech, uh, the, the chariot, um, bronze weapons, various other advances, they're able to ride out of Egypt and consolidate control over the Levant and up into Syria. Uh, Amos, the first of the dynasty here, is the one who expels the Hyksos. Hatshepsut, who I have illustrated on the screen, was a very famous female pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, she was the regent for the young boy, Tutmothus III, but ended up seizing control of the kingdom uh, while he was young and ruled as a pharaoh in her own right. Very important. Um, you'll often see her depicted even with the beard of the pharaoh attached to her. And you can sometimes see on the sculpture the uh, chin straps holding that beard on because it was ceremonial. It didn't mean she actually had a beard, but she did wear one. 
Uh, but this young boy, Tutmosis III, eventually grows up and becomes quite an impressive military figure in his own right, and he is going to create the great empire. He's often compared to Napoleon for ancient Egypt, and this is a statue of Tutmosis III. Now, the empire continues on. Eventually, you get to kind of a controversial figure, Amenhotep IV. We'll study him when we talk about the Amarna period later. Uh, he is more known for his religious uh, revolution in Egypt, which is connected with the advent of what appears to be some kind of monotheistic movement, though that's itself questionable. He's more famously known as Akhenaten. Very distinct features. Uh, I'd say if you're doing a presentation on Egyptian art, I would include a picture of Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV at some point, also because that period known as the Amarna period has some really distinctives when it comes to art in general, some stylistic changes that coincide briefly. Okay, So this is an example of Amarna period art. Moving on, still in the uh, New Kingdom period, the famous Ramesses the Great, or Ramesses the Second. This is in the 19th dynasty. Um, the last one, by the way, the 18th dynasty, one of the most famous dynasties. Uh, 19th dynasty, Ramesses II, probably the most famous pharaoh. Um, almost every movie you see of uh, Egypt, you have to throw in a Ramesses. Um, very famous name, but this is the most famous of the guys that ever held that name. And he reigned longer than any monarch. Of ancient Egypt, I don't even know. It might be longer than any monarch in history. 67 years as king. And that's a picture of him today. He doesn't look as good as he used to, but we do have his mummy. It's in the Cairo Museum. I was fortunate enough to see that myself when I went to Cairo. Um, it's really interesting when you walk through a museum like the Museum in Cairo and you come across these guys that have been dead for, you know, 3,000 plus years, uh, and you can look them in the face. Um, it's a very strange feeling. He uh, also fought one of the earliest recorded battles in history, uh, not the earliest, but one of the earliest, uh, at the Battle of Kadesh, around 1280, against the Hittites. We'll talk about them in a second. And then the next dynasty, you've got Ramesses III, who left some records of a very interesting event known as the Invasion of the Sea Peoples, which you see on the left-hand side of the screen. The right side, by the way, is uh, statues of Ramesses and the uh, mummy of Ramesses II. On the left, you see the... Um, inscriptions and illustrations from the Temple at Menon at Habu, where Ramesses III recorded his victory over the Sea Peoples. Uh, now, this group of Sea Peoples show up not only in Egyptian writings, but is going to be relevant to a discussion of what happens in the rest of the Near East, including the later Bronze Age Greek world, because around 1150, you have a collapse, uh, an entire systemic collapse of that eastern portion of the Mediterranean. And a lot of people, at least when I was in grad school, the theory was the Sea Peoples have something to do with this collapse. Now, Egypt does not collapse at that time. Um, they actually were able to withstand the invasion of the Sea People, but there was a major collapse elsewhere. And I'll bring that up a few times as we progress. The Third Intermediate Period, disunity. You have um, you know Egypt ruled from various places. You've got a Libyan invasion, Nubian invasion, Assyrians come in. So you've got various people ruling in various portions of Egypt. And then the late period from 525 to 332, uh, you have the Persians ruling. Okay, I'll talk about the Persians in a little bit, so I don't want to focus on them now. And that is followed by the last period for Egypt, which is going to be known as the Greek period or the Hellenistic period or the Ptolemaic kingdom. Now, we're going to study Greece later. We're going to focus in on the Hellenistic period specifically as well, but that is a period where Alexandria becomes the center, and there's a dynasty of Greek Macedonian rulers known as the Ptolemies. And this period begins with the conquest of Alexander the Great, and it concludes with the conquest of Rome. And the very last pharaoh of Egypt, more or less, is the queen by the name of Cleopatra, Cleopatra VII. She's the famous one, and that's a statue of, a preserve, you know, a bust of Cleopatra. Okay, so that's going to wrap up Egypt for now. And by the way, the other illustration is a famous mosaic from Pompeii that illustrates Alexander in his battle with Darius III. So it's the end of Persian rule when Alexander comes in. Okay, I know I'm going quickly. I know I'm going through a lot of stuff. 
Um, again, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch this later. And I'll ask for questions near the end. So if you do have questions, by the way, go ahead and text them and type them because I'll be able to see those off to the side. Uh, we're going to go to the north now. So Egypt is down in North Africa. If you kind of move directly up on the map, you get to Anatolia, what's often called Asia Minor. It's modern Turkey. And here you can see the center of Hittite civilization. This is the first great Indo-European empire uh, in world history. The Hittites were Indo-European peoples, and they settled, settled in central Mesopotamia. I'm not sorry, central Anatolia. And when that was, probably somewhere prior to 2000, okay, 2000 BC. Now here you don't have kings arise out of the priestly class as far as we know, but kind of the the military leader, the, the, the strong man, the chieftain, who emerges as dominant king. They do adopt a lot of cultural aspects from Mesopotamia, a lot of interaction with Mesopotamia, so you can see Mesopotamian gods and institutions and stuff like that among the Hittites. But they were also masters of their own style of architecture, built superb cities, well fortified. Here you see the city of Hattusas, one of the gates of Hattusas, which is the capital. Um, and they were also once believed to have had a monopoly on iron. Uh, this is still during the Bronze Age. We know that they used iron, maybe not universally, but they did have iron weapons. Um, the Iron Age doesn't begin until really the Hittite collapse. I don't know that anybody holds to a, this idea of a monopoly today, but we do know that they had this technology. Now, as far as the chronology goes, like I said, they settle in the region somewhere around 2000. We start seeing um, names and stuff in records as early as uh, 1900. Then we will break them down into basically two periods, an old kingdom and a new kingdom. The old kingdom for the Hittites would have been between 1680 and 1500. There's unification under a guy by the name of Labarna I. And then his son, Labarna II, assumes the name Hattusili, and he's responsible for the moving of the capital to this famous city that I just mentioned and that we just looked at, known as Hattusos, up situated up in the mountains of Anatolia. By the time you get to 1600, one of the Hittite kings, Mursili I, sacks Babylon. We just mentioned that when we talked about the Babylonian collapse of the old Babylonian Empire. Here's the guy responsible for sacking that city and weakening Babylon. It's Mursili. The Hittites themselves go into decline after that. Uh, Telepinu, King Telepinu, uh, signs a treaty, one of the earliest treaties we have from the Hittite records, that might show a weakness on the part of the Hittites. You know, when you start to have to sign peace treaties and treaties with other groups, you, maybe you're not in the same position of power that you once were. That's not necessarily the case, but we do know they go into decline for a little while. And they're eclipsed by the Mitanni civilization very briefly, but then uh, there's a resurgence known as the Hittite Renaissance or the Empire period from 1386 to about 1200. Now, the big name here is a guy by the name of Supaluliuma. I just like his name and I like saying it, which is why I have to include him. But he basically starts to create an empire by conquering down into Syria. Now, if you remember a second ago, this coincides with the new kingdom of Egypt. So you're going to run into a clash. The Egyptian empire coming from the south, the Hittite empire coming down from the north, and it was bound to happen, conflict. And that's where we get to this battle of Kadesh. Okay, I, I said it's around 1280, it's probably closer to 1275, but the Battle of Kadesh is going to be between Hittite King Muatali II and the great Ramesses II. Now, Ramesses records the battle as a great victory. Of course, we've got multiple versions of the story, and we do know Ramesses almost got himself killed at Kadesh, got surrounded and cut off from most of his army by the Hittites. Unfortunately, Muatali did not take advantage of the moment, and Ramesses was rescued, fought his way to freedom, and claims a victory. Um, what basically happens is it's a draw, and years later, a treaty is going to be signed, uh, which you see there, between the Hittites and the Egyptians, which bring on what's essentially a cold war. There's no open aggression, but a period of tension between the two. Of course, that word cold war more likely draws memory of you know the situation between the Soviet Union and the United States back into the um, you know 50s 60s and up to the 80s anyways nearing the end of that period the Hittite capital will be burned 
around 1180, the Bronze Age will come to an end and the Hittites themselves will collapse due to Phrygian migrations. And that's again that period we talked about where the Sea Peoples are going to show up on the scene. Okay, so there's your Hittite uh, civilization. Now, the reason they're important, culturally speaking, is they do show up a number of times in the Old Testament. So they are a name associated with some of the traditions of the Hebrew people. But they also have some interaction with the Bronze Age Greeks, and there's a lot of speculation as to what role they play in the emerging tradition that relates to the Trojan War. Um, so if you look at the map, you could see that the Hittite Empire extended all the way to the coast, which was a region basically controlled by Greeks later on, um, and that's where the city of Troy is actually located, just north of where you see the Hittite sphere of influence. Okay, let's go further. Assyria. We're, we're getting down to the last three empires. Assyria, Babylon, Persia. Um, Assyria is going to be northern Mesopotamia. They have a long history. A few major cities, Asher, Nimrud, Nineveh. Uh, I'm not going to concentrate on very many of them, but Nineveh is particularly important, as we'll see in a little bit. And for a while, you see them mentioned in other people's records. The Sumerians, you know, mentioned them. The Babylonians overthrew a, a Syrian kingdom. The Mitanni eclipsed them. They have their own moments where they try to assert themselves as a great power. The first attempt between 1365 and 1208, you've got a very brief expansion, but then they withdraw, and there's a dark age, okay, with the exception of maybe Tiglath Pileser I, who tries to create an empire. But the dates, notice, you know, that's the period when the Egyptians and the Hittites are getting near their their collapse. And what happens after the Hittite collapse, after the general collapse of the ancient Near East, you could think of there being kind of a power vacuum and an opportunity for the Assyrians to eventually start to build an empire without the threat of you know, the Hittites or other powers. And when we get down to the ninth century, you've got a few early attempts at building a, a real empire. In the 9th century, you've got Ashurnasir Paul II, who invades the regions of the Levant known as Phoenicia. Now, the Phoenicians I haven't talked about, but they're really, really important for ancient trade. They're probably the dominant sea power in the eastern Mediterranean as far as trading power. They also have been credited with the development of the alphabet and are going to have a big influence on early Greece. Obviously, our alphabet derives by way of different uh, other intermediaries back to the Phoenicians in their alphabet. Um, anyways, this attack on the Phoenicians, in particular by Shalmaneser III, who was his successor from uh, 859 to 824, possibly resulted in um, some people leaving the region of Phoenicia. So later on, we're going to be talking about ancient Rome. You guys are going to be dealing with the poetry of Virgil. And in the poetry of Virgil, you've got the famous Aeneid, which is the story of uh, the founding of Rome, the legendary founding of Rome by the great hero Aeneas. And interwoven with the tradition of Roman legend was the connection of early Rome with early Carthage. Now, Carthage is a major uh, competitor during the Roman Republic, the Middle Republic. And according to traditions, Carthage was founded somewhere around the end of the 9th century by a queen known as Elissa. She shows up by the name of Dido in the story of uh, Virgil. Seems to be a historical figure, very possibly. And that city would have been founded around the same time that Phoenicia is under you know, this constant uh, conquest by the Assyrians. So it's very possible that there was a movement of people from places like Tyre, to safer regions. Um, this may have been, maybe Carthage was founded in response, that's one of the theories, in response to Assyrian aggression and some of the maybe changing politics of the time. But Carthage is in North Africa. Uh, I don't have a, on a map here for you guys, but it's just south of Sicily in Italy and uh, is pretty much safe from all these uh, political empires of the Near East like Assyria. Anyways, the true Assyrian Empire really begins in the 8th century under Tiglath-Pileser III and is going to follow down through various successors. I just put a few of the big names on the screen. Uh, Shalmaneser V goes to war against Israel. That's going to be pretty important, as well as you know Tyre and Phoenicia. But around 725, he lays siege to the city of Samaria, which is the capital of Israel. We'll talk about this in more depth when we get to the Hebrew history. 
722, his successor Sargon II takes the city. And you have the deportation of the Israelite tribes. It's known as the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. This is a major event in the Old Testament. Uh, then, of course, you have his successors. Sennacherib also moves the capital of Syria to a place known as Nineveh. And then by the time we get to Ashhaddon in 681, uh, he eventually conquers Egypt in 671. And Egypt is kind of at the extent as far as how much territory it controls. Last major king worth noting is Ashurbanipal. He is the strongest, last really strong king of Assyria. He builds a great library at that city of Nineveh. And it's thanks to the destruction of Nineveh in 612 that we have a preservation of that great library. It was, you know, burned and sacked by the Babylonians, Medes, and Scythians. And that brings essentially an end to the empire of the Assyrians. Uh, By 609, the remnants of the Assyrian army are kind of wiped up by the Babylonians, but very important period. And I just skipped over a few uh, illustrations that I probably should point out. So let me go back a few slides. Right here, we're looking at the ruins of the city of Nimrud the archaeological site. And the picture on the right, I included, uh, this kind of stuff always upsets me as an archaeologist, but just as a person that loves um, art and history. And that's the destruction of some of these relief sculptures and texts that was going on very recently by ISIS um, in Mesopotamia. So some of the, uh, this is just, not just this, but the other picture that I'm going to go back to in a second, uh, destruction of priceless ancient records. Um, You know, it's good when we get these things into a museum. Uh, These slides, by the way, worth noting if you're doing your presentation on Assyrian relief sculpture, the um, sculptures that you see are pretty standard types of subject matter for the Assyrians. They tended to be fairly cruel as an empire. Uh, You have a depiction of them flaying their enemies, skinning them alive, and impaling people on spikes. The Assyrians tried to keep people from rebelling using uh, intimidation tactics. It doesn't always work. They constantly have revolt and rebellion. Um, We'll see a better policy by the Persians a little bit later. But here we've got uh, the ruins of Nineveh, and again, Isis coming in with bulldozers and destroying some of the remains or reconstructions of these great uh, centers. You know, some stuff will probably be lost forever, uh, which is really, really sad. Luckily, we have records and photographs, but um, a lot of this stuff is being lost today. Uh, A great crime against humanity, in my opinion. Finally, we get to the Chaldeans. This is the resurgence of the Babylonian power. They do have a comeback um, at the time of the 7th century under Nebuchadnezzar. So this is not the Amorite Babylonians, but but the Chaldean Babylonians. It's a new group of people that have come into the Babylonian region at this time. And the um, King Nebuchadnezzar is the one who's responsible for ending the Assyrian domination, but he himself starts to build an empire in that power vacuum. He does make alliances with Medes to the um, east and the Scythians and uh, founds this dynasty, but his son is going to be more important. His son is Nebuchadnezzar II. He is another name that you might be familiar with. There are only a few really Babylonian names people generally do know of, Hammurabi being one, Nebuchadnezzar being the second, and it's Nebuchadnezzar thanks to the Hebrew writings. He, again, is another figure that shows up in the Hebrew scriptures and builds a great empire, but a short-lived empire during his reign. So the new Babylonian Empire kind of consolidates around the Battle of Carchemish, where he defeats the Egyptians, who are trying to make a comeback themselves. And then you've got a lot of interaction, again, with not Israel, but the remaining kingdom, which was the kingdom of Judah. And ultimately, it's conflict with Babylonia that leads to the destruction of Jerusalem, the exile of the tribe of Judah um, in 586 BC. We'll talk about that when we do the Hebrew people later as well. Eventually, Babylon falls. 539 is the date for that. Nabonidus is the last king of the dynasty. And in 539, it's the Persians who come in and take control of Babylon. And that's in the midst of building for themselves their massive, massive empire. This is the last one we're going to cover today. I'm actually going to do it in the time period. I've never done this before, so I'm kind of proud. But uh, the Persian Empire, this is... This is the greatest, largest, 
possibly longest running empire or region that builds empires in the ancient world. I say that because there are multiple Persian empires or empires situated in Persia. And we're going to look at all three of those in a second. But the map you see is the territorial extent of Persia, which goes from the Indus River Valley in the east all the way into Europe and Libya on the west. Okay. Now the Medes and the Persians, those are two tribes that are very similar in that they're both Indo-European or Aryan people groups. You probably heard the term Aryan before. Unfortunately, most people think of Adolf Hitler when they think of Aryan, but the actual Aryan peoples are the peoples that settled in India throughout this region and even into Europe. Um, very wide ranging physical characteristics. So you don't want to think of them as your blonde haired, blue eyed Nordic people the way uh, Adolf Hitler thought of them, but um, you know, wide ranging groups. So, you know, modern people in Iran today are basically Aryan peoples. They're not Semitic peoples like you'd see in places like Iraq and Arabia. Anyways, this is the next big Indo European power. And it's often referred to as the Medio Persian Empire because there's a union between those two groups, and that's basically how the Greeks refer to them, often just as the Medes. Important cities, and you can see these on the map, though I know it's very small and you can't see where my cursor is going, but Ekbatana would have been the Mede capital. That's right by the word media on the map. It's in the, um, you know, just to the uh, east of the Zagros Mountains. Pasargadai, the capital of the great Cyrus. And then Persepolis, the successor capital built by the great king Darius the Great. Susa, a um, very important city. This is the capital of Elam, who we keep mentioning. Elam tends to be uh, the region where the Persians first come to power. And then if you go all the way over into Anatolia, where you see the word Lydia, just south of the Black Sea, you've got the city of Sardis, which was the westernmost capital of the empire. It's such a large empire, they had multiple governors known as satraps, and here we go on the next slide, that governed these territories known as satrapies. So the Persians evolve a much more efficient way of governing. And you need to do this when you have a territory that's so big. So the, the um, Persian governor or satrap of the, uh, that region would have been situated in Sardis. Uh, itself, it was the capital of another great kingdom prior to, known as the Lydian, cap, uh, Lydian kingdom, which we'll mention maybe briefly in a second. Now, to unify the entire empire and communicate, there was a royal road. This was running from Sardis to Susa. It was 1,600 miles of road. And the Persians had a mail system developed so that they can carry communications back and forth throughout this region from uh, governor to governor. And they also adopted a uniform coinage, which was very efficient for trade. Now, one of the reasons I call them fairly enlightened is also because of how they rule. So let's just do a very quick chronology. The Medes uh, come to power first. We see them under Assyrian domination for a while, and we know that you have early kings that show up in, in Greek writing. So, for instance, you have uh, Deokes, who is mentioned as an early king of Media by Herodotus. Now, one of you guys' groups are going to be doing a presentation on Herodotus. He is the father of history, and we don't always take seriously everything he has to say. So there are some questions as to, you know, the historical reliability of the text when it comes to the early Mede kings. But the king known as Saxares, who's supposedly the son of Deokes, was uh, an ally of Nabopolassar in the destruction of Nineveh in 612. The last date on this particular slide, around 600, I'm also going to put a figure by the name of Zarathustra, on the board. We'll talk about Zarathustra and the religion of Zoroastrianism on a different lecture. Uh, there are debates as to when this figure would have lived, but a lot of scholars do put it around 600. And he would have been from this vicinity. Now, the Achaemenid Empire, or the first Persian Empire, founded by Cyrus II or Cyrus the Great. Now, he was half Persian, half Mede. On his mother's side, he was a Mede, and his grandfather happened to be the king of the Medes, a guy by the name of Astyages. Around 553, he rebels against his grandfather after uniting the Persians. 
Then he unifies the Persians and the Medes together, which is interesting. He doesn't have his grandfather killed. He ousts him, but then he keeps a lot of the Medes in position of authority, uh, keeps the structure that the Mede government had in place. A lot of the Median army is just incorporated into the Persian army, and you do have a true unification. This is why I say the Persians are going to be more successful than the Assyrians and other groups because they tend to um, incorporate ideas of other groups and not be using oppression and terror to, to, to try to put people under their thumb. And Cyrus kind of starts this process. He expands into the West, uh, conquering Lydia. Very famous story, the famous King Croesus of Lydia, who was one of the richest men in the world. You know, the, the idea of the, being as rich as Croesus became a saying. Uh, still kind of a famous saying, though it's not as famous as it used to be. Uh, and the Greeks of that region, the famous story, by the way, of Croesus and the prophecy about him going out to try to conquer um, and face Cyrus in battle. And we'll talk maybe about that story when we get into Greek religion later because it does have to do with uh, a prophecy given to him by the Greek uh, oracle at Delphi. Uh, it's, a fun, it's a lot of fun stories when, when it comes to Delphi, but we'll deal with that later. Anyways, he conquers all the way to Persia in the west, I'm sorry, in the east, I'm sorry, <laughs> India in the east and Anatolia in the west. Possibly dies in battle. We don't know for sure. There are different records as to how he passed away, but it may have been um, in battle in the east uh, in 529. His conquest of Babylon is also important because it really, um, results in the freeing of the Jews who are in captivity there in the end of the Babylonian exile. And when the Jews write about him, uh, Hebrew scriptures refer to Cyrus as a messiah, a uh, savior figure, because he did allow them to go back home and begin or you know rebuild their, their temple and stuff like that. So he was fairly enlightened as a ruler. The uh, map here, just a bigger version of it, you can see how the territories were actually added to. Um, you can see the territories added by Cyrus, the territories added by his son Cambyses in the yellow, which would be Egypt, and then the territories added by the great... Um, Darius and Xerxes up in Europe in the orange. Okay, so by the time of Cyrus's death, you don't have the the yellow or the orange portion, but everything else would have been part of his empire at that time. Cambyses comes in, takes over Egypt. A lot of fun stories. If you're interested in writing a biography for one of your papers, um, the transition between Cambyses and Darius is a fascinating story of palace intrigue, uh, very much suspicious. Um, writings involving, you know, assassination of brothers and warfare. Darius basically leaves us some records. Uh, when he comes to power, he was a cousin of Cambyses and is considered part of the same dynasty, the Achaemenid dynasty, but he was not a son and successor. He had to actually defeat a number of rivals in battle and a number of battles. And his record of his victory is preserved in what's known as the Behistun inscription, which you see a picture of there. Now, if you're doing Persian relief sculpture, you probably want to include the Behistun inscription because it has a relief sculpture, as well as text written in several languages recounting his victories over his opponents. And uh, I'll show you another picture of that in a second. I think the next slide has some as well. But it's written in Persian, Elamite, and Akkadian. It's in the Zagros Mountains, so you know travelers by can read it no matter what language you speak. Of course, it is pretty high up on the cliffside, so I don't know how easy it was to read. Um, after Darius, actually not after Darius, you've got a number of, uh, actually during Darius's reign, conflicts with the Greek world begin. We're going to cover all of these when we do the Greek history. So the Ionian Revolt, the Persian Wars, all of that takes place during the reign of Darius I. Uh, here is the Behistun inscription a little bit closer up. So you can see uh, Darius standing there as a uh, victor over these people with their hands tied behind their back, coming in procession to submit to him. Okay. Um, I have a temptation to really want to go ahead and talk about the whole incident about, you know, suspicion as to his legitimacy on the throne, but I, I think I will leave that up to one of you guys. Um, so I would definitely highly recommend that. Um, it would be a fun paper for me to read. So if you don't have an idea, Go ahead and do a biography on Darius and his conquest of Persia after Cambyses. Anyways, uh, next few figures, uh, Xerxes, the son of Darius. This is uh, Xerxes I. He's going to be famous for his invasion, massive, massive invasion of, of Greece known as the Second Persian War. He eventually is uh, killed uh, 
if you've seen the movie 300, uh, you would think he was a seven foot tall bald man with piercings throughout his body. Uh, the real Xerxes didn't look anything like that. Um, and I'm sure he wasn't seven feet tall. The uh, figure of Artaxerxes, the next ruler, I'm just putting him on the map because he is uh, a guy who kind of moves Persia to the embracing of Zoroastrian calendar officially. There's debate as to whether there were Zoroastrian um, worship by Xerxes and Darius prior to him, but definitely by the time of Artaxerxes, Zoroastrianism is on its ascendancy. And then the last king of the Achaemenid dynasties is, is Darius III, who is the one who loses his territory to the great Alexander. Um, he is assassinated by his own people, his own generals, near the end in 330, and as he's the last of his dynasty. And then you have the period of rule by various other um, people. So I just give you a very quick timeline to end this. Uh, Alexander the Great basically takes over Persia by 632, uh, 630, the death of Darius the third. Uh, Alexander himself dies in uh, 323. He has the entire territory in his hands. So you'd say the Persian Empire is now the Empire of Alexander. After his death, his entire empire fragments between his generals. We'll look at this later. Seleucus, one of his generals, ends up taking control of Mesopotamia and later Persia around 312. And then after the Seleucids lose control of Persia, you have the rise of the Parthians under Arsakes, establishing a dynasty in the mid-3rd century BC. So around 247, the Parthians form a dynasty and an empire. We can refer to this as the Second Persian Empire. It's usually better just to refer to it as the Parthian Empire. They have a great deal of conflict, not only with the Greek Hellenistic world, but also with the Romans. And in the 2nd century AD, the war culminates with uh, more Roman victories. It was kind of a stalemate for a long while. Sometimes the Parthians had the best of it. Sometimes the Romans did. But by the second century AD, the Romans come out on top. Parthians collapse. And in the early third century, around 226, you have our third empire arise. This is going to be known as the Sasanian Empire, founded by Ardashir. And this last empire is going to be a very... Um, strong Zoroastrian power, um, Zoroastrianism being the religion of the empire, also continues in its conflict with Rome, which by this period is starting to embrace Christianity and will eventually morph into the Byzantine Empire after the west of Rome falls in uh, 476. And the last date there I've got with the Roman Emperor Heraclius, going to war against the Sasanians and leading to a very, very important defeat of the Sasanians around 627. Now, this war will cover at the very end of the semester when we do the Byzantine Empire and the rise of the Arabian power, but it's thanks to this warfare between Persia and Rome and the collapse of Persia and the weakening of Rome where you have the ability of a new power to come on the scene, and that's going to be the Arab armies. And the conquest of this region takes place around 641, though it takes a while to subjugate all of Iran. And this is also going to bring with it the advent of Islam, which is going to displace Zoroastrianism as the major religion. So we'll talk about all this stuff again down the road. Now, that is it for the PowerPoint. And... Like I said, those of you that stuck with me for the entire time, I really appreciate it. The period that we covered, it's a lot of history. And like I said, in a number of places, there are so many things we could be talking about. We just don't have the time. Um, class like this, you know it's broad. Uh, I do slow down when we get to Greece and Rome, and there are reasons for that. Uh, a lot more records being one of them, and a lot more of an impact on um, the development of Western civilization as well. But these also are cultures that have a big influence on Western civilization and world civilization. So they're worth noting. I always wanted to take more time with these, but if I did, we'd never get anywhere in this semester. So I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to open up for a few questions now. If you guys have questions... Um, the big thing I wanted you to get were ideas, where to go with your presentations.
Hopefully you even got some ideas for your term papers, like I said. So does anybody have a comment they want to um, share or a question that I can answer before I let you guys go? I know we're over time, so if you don't, that's fine. You can always email me. You can always reach me at my email. We're going to pick up next time looking at, if I believe I remember correctly, the ancient religions of Mesopotamia and Egypt, as well as the Amarna Revolution. Don't know if we're going to do that all in the same class. I'll have to look at the schedule, but that's the plan for the future. So um, I will see you guys next session. And again, thanks for tuning in.